Start a Therapy Practice Podcast, episode number 44. Hey there, this is Scott Harmon from StartAtherapyPractice.com. So glad you're listening today. I'm here to give you that extra oomph, that need, that oomph to start and run a therapy practice, to market that practice, and then to take your business skills to the next level, that oomph. That's what I'm here for. Happy to help you out. So glad you're listening today. Today we have an interview with Stacy Menz. She's a pediatric physical therapist in private practice. But before we get to that interview, I wanted to be sure that you knew about all of my free stuff over at StartAtherapyPractice.com. Free forms, a free client tracking spreadsheet that I use in my private practice every day. I have a free guide on how to get your clients to give you a Google review. Google reviews are great. And that's just a free how-to guide. Super easy. I also have a private practice success checklist. And that is from a previous podcast, but it's a checklist just to put up there on your refrigerator and pay attention to it and say, yeah, am I doing that? I'm doing that for my private practice. Even if you're not in private practice, that checklist is going to be super helpful to make sure that your future private practice is a success. So be sure to go by startatherapypractice.com and get all of that free stuff. Super cool, super helpful. Now, Stacey Menz is a physical therapist, a pediatric physical therapist, and her private practice is Starfish Therapies, and you can check that out at starfishtherapies.com. And I really enjoyed hearing her story because it's very similar to mine. And so if you want to reach out to Stacy, you can email her at stacymenz, that's S-T-A-C-Y-M-E-N-Z, at gmail.com. And I'll mention that again at the end of the show. And we're going to mention some web links today in this episode, so be sure to go over to startatherapypractice.com backslash 44 and you'll see all of the links that we mentioned in here today. You don't want to miss any of these. And with that, let's get to the interview. Here we go. Hey there, this is Scott at startatherapypractice.com, and I'm with Stacy Menz. She is a physical therapist at Starfish Therapies. How are you doing, Stacy? Thanks for joining me. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Yes. I want you to give us a little bit of background. Uh, as I mentioned, you're a physical therapist, a pediatric physical therapist. And you're the owner of Starfish Therapy. So I want you to give us some background of sort of where you started off in the physical therapy world and then what led you up to becoming a private practice owner. All right. Well, it's a little bit of a roundabout tale. Um, I graduated school back in early 2000, late 99, when the Balanced Budget Act had come through and there was no jobs available. Um, my goal had always been to work in pediatrics. And I remember interviewing at the place that I wanted to work and was told, you know what, keep interviewing, take whatever you can find and then look for what you want. And so that kind of started my path. Originally, you know, I took a job in outpatient ortho, which was a great experience, but never what I wanted to do. And then I quickly moved into adult acute care. Um, I loved the hospital setting. I liked the pace. I liked the interdisciplinary care. Um, I just liked that I was in a teaching hospital. I liked the learning that went on there. And I moved from, I was in New York at the time and I decided to move to California and it was just easier to get a job in acute care. I loved it. It was great. And then I became a little bit professionally bored. Not that there wasn't more to learn, but I just wasn't sure what path I was going to go. And I went to school at Boston University and they sent me a thing saying they had a transitional doctorate program going online. And it was just kind of the right time. So I went back and did my transitional doctorate. And at that time, I said, you know what? I went to school to work with kids. It's what I've always wanted to do. Five years later, I'm still working with adults. And so I sent out some resumes and I took a job up in the San Francisco Bay Area working at a pediatric private practice up there. Um, I loved what I did there. It was great to get my hands back into working with kids again. I had done some internships. I grew up working with children. So it wasn't that far and it was just kind of getting my skills kind of back online again. And it was a little bit challenging. We were working for a company where it was a parent of a child with special needs that owned the company. And so there were some things that I struggled with as the way she ran it. And having worked at other jobs before, there were things that I was like, this isn't right. And I wasn't comfortable with it. 
And at that same time, somebody came and was helping out over the summer that was doing early intervention in the Bay Area. And she explained the process to me. And I just thought, well, that sounds nice to expand my repertoire. And so I just started picking up some private clients um, through early intervention. And at that point, I gave my boss probably about three months notice. And I said, at the end of this year, which was the end of 2006, I'm going to be leaving. And so I just went out and was on my own, just doing some EI. And from there, it just kind of happened. <laughs> um, so I went out early 2007 on my own. Yes. No, that's that's good. I, w- I want to go back just a little bit, though, because I've always found this interesting when I find a therapist who worked for a person who was not a therapist. I've done that before myself. And I, you mentioned that you had some things that were you were not comfortable with as far as in that setting. Correct. Did, did, what are some of the, I guess, what are some of the pitfalls that other therapists should look for when they potentially go work for a, someone who is not a therapist? So one of the big ones was understanding the license requirements for the state. So we were all licensed. However, she was a big believer in some of the methods and treatment techniques, more of the intensive model that was being used in Poland and some equipment from over there. And while I loved what they were doing, she was bringing over PTs that were PTs in Poland, but were not PTs in the United States. And she was trying to get us to just sign off on their notes as they were treating a child. And Mm. that's not legal. (laughs) So, and she just had a really hard time understanding that she's like, but they are therapists. And we were explaining, yes, but they're not legally allowed to call themselves a physical therapist or work as a physical therapist in the state of California. And so it was a lot of explaining that. And then she tried to tell us how to do our treating which is a little bit different than having a mentor or another therapist with a lot of experience collaborating with you and coaching you. She wanted us to do a certain amount of time on this um, type of equipment or using this piece of um, paraphernalia. And it just was not sitting well with me. And I was kind of the squeaky wheel. Well, and I find, I find that's the reason why some therapists go into private practice, just because they're working for someone who is not a therapist or has never been a therapist. And so they don't have the perspective of where the therapist is coming from and how things should be done. And they tend to overstep their boundaries or the boundaries of the therapist. So it's good motivation to go into, into private practice. And I could see why you did that for sure. Yes. I mean, I loved what we were doing there. I just didn't like how it was being run. Yes. So that was 2006. That's about the same time I was starting my private practice. And in 2006, you said you went in to start, started doing EI. So tell us about that experience as far as how you received referrals, how you connected with the EI system, how you did your progress notes and your billing with the early intervention system. So at that time, it was pretty simple. It's changed a little bit now, and I'm not fully aware of all the changes that have happened to get involved in early intervention in our area because we're already involved. Um, But at that time, I just had to basically send my resume, send a request that I would like to become a vendor vendor through them. And I was individually vendored. Um, Our regional centers are the California agency that handles early intervention for the state. So I had to become a vendor of the regional center in my area. And then basically the social workers would just, um, or the case managers would send out requests um, via email. They would call you. It was kind of a mix back then. Now, mostly it's email that they use, but, and they just say, do you have any availability? And I found that once you started saying yes to somebody, you were kind of forefront in their mind. So you start to get a ton of referrals from that same person. And they were always looking for somebody that was available to take on kids. And now it's definitely also changed because at the time, early, the regional center was the payer, of, um, the primary payer for zero to three. And now kids that are zero to three have to use their insurance first or prove that they aren't able to get funding from insurance before then regional center will start paying. So then at that, at that point, were you billing, did you as the therapist have to bill the insurance? No. So the regional center, we would just submit in the beginning, it was paper. They finally switched to online, which makes life so much easier. Um, And we would just submit basically our time cards for when we saw those patients. And then every minute, every six months, we would have to turn in a progress report with updated um, 
skill levels. And they really like to use age equivalents out here, which are not the most valid form. And so we constantly are referring them back to standard scores and percentiles, but we still have to include the age equivalents because that's what they are requesting um, to justify that the child is eligible. And once they start switching to insurance, I was no longer just on my own. So in that meantime, there's about a six month period, four to six month period in early 2007 that I started incorporating and was getting all that together. And then in July of 2007, I started working as my company. I was an employee of my company, um, no longer just an independent contractor. And at that point, we had already started the, I had already started the process of getting in network with some insurances. So when Regional Center made this switch, it affected us some because they were our primary referrer at that point in time, and they were still figuring out what to do. And so we took a huge cut in referrals. Um, And I had two employees at that point in time, and I basically stopped taking a paycheck so that I didn't have to let go the other two employees while everything was being figured out. But it taught me a huge lesson in diversifying referral sources so that all my eggs weren't in one basket. And luckily we had already started that process. And yes, we do, sorry. Yes, we do have to build the insurance ourselves because then they're actually going through a medical model. gets a little dicey because they're no longer truly, because with the regional center, we have to see them in their natural environment, but in the medical model, unless their insurance allows it, they have to come into the clinic. (laughs) That gets interesting, doesn't it? Yes. (laughs) I want want to go back just a little bit. And you, when you transition from working for the private practice that you were at and then jumped into EI, was there any financial pain that was involved in that? That seems like a pretty big jump. Um, no, it wasn't too bad. I So I had started seeing some EI kids while I was still at the other company, um, which was fine. It wasn't a conflict of interest. We weren't seeing EI kids there except for aquatic therapy, and that was not something I was going to be providing. And I just basically took the money I made from there and put it away. So I had almost six months worth. And I wasn't seeing that many kids, but it was enough to cover at least one paycheck or two paychecks. And then I had, I was slowly growing my referral or my caseload at that point in time. And so when it was just me, it was actually really easy. I made more money just as me than I do now (laughs) having employees. I can sympathize. (laughs) Yes. So, so you gradually started building up your caseload And tell us about how you diversified your referral sources. How'd you go about doing that? So some of it happened naturally. I have one of our company values is solution oriented. So my approach is always, how do we make that work versus no, we can't do it. And that has been to my detriment occasionally, but it has also helped us to diversify and to take on opportunities that we might not have had the chance to, which has led into other more opportunities. So I. I did not have a clinic when I first um, hired my first employee. We were just doing EI, some school-based and some private pay. Uh, There had been patients who had been at my previous practice that found me again, and they wanted me to go see their child at the school because it was a more severely involved population, and some of the school therapists the parents weren't comfortable with, um, or the school, a lot of schools out here don't have a physical therapist on staff, and so... There may be one or two kids at the school that the school feels feels needs physical therapy. So they will do contracts just for that child. Um, So I found that that way, some private pay. And then with kids that start to turn three, they were asking, can we continue to see you? I did also have a therapist that was doing EI go out on maternity leave. And she transitioned a lot of her caseload over to me which was mostly EI, but there's a few private pay kids in there. And then when she came back, she didn't take them back. She was only coming back part-time. And so she has actually been my biggest referral source. It was because of her that we ended up in our clinic space. Um, you know, she, we have a great relationship. She still calls me just the other day. She's like, hey, I have a school district that's looking for a therapist. I can't do it. Are you, do you guys have the availability? That's a, that's a great position to be in. Have that referral source that potentially could be competition. So always like to say your competition is often to somebody who can refer to you. So look mm-hmm. at them, how can you help each other out in that regard? Exactly. Yes. So where I'm at, there is, it's a little bit territorial as far as school districts or even some of the other programs that are out there. Do you see any, 
in where you're at, do you see any territorial um, hangups with whether it be a school district or another program where they say, hey, you can't come in here and you can't treat no matter what, even if the parent wants you in here? Well, the school, to, the school would have to approve us. So the parent basically, for those kind of one-off cases, in the beginning, the parent went to the school district and said, you haven't been able to provide a therapist that meets the needs of my child. We're bringing you on. And then the school district can say yes or no. In the meantime, we had also become a non-public agency with the state of California, which means we go through this entire approval process, pay the state money, and then they say, yes, they have our, our rates are kind of finalized with them. Um, they've given our stamp of approval. So it makes it easier for a school district to say, sure, we'll take you. Like you've gone through this vetting process. Um, so in that regard, the parent can't just bring in a therapist that does have to get approved. So we're actually finding now that we get referred by other school districts to different school districts. So they might've had somebody that came from a staffing agency and some of the staffing agencies, not all of them, but some of them out here will send a new grad in, but there's no support there for that new grad. And so they may get overwhelmed or they can't handle it or the cost of living out here causes people to move away. And then all of a sudden they now don't have a therapist providing services. These minutes have to be provided. And so we've taken on districts that were months behind on minutes because somebody left and they couldn't find a replacement. And so we've, we've got, we had a, we've built a good reputation with these schools because we've gone and we've covered their minutes. We make sure all the current minutes get seen. And we also, even though we work in the insurance and private pay and EI, we have a really good handle on educationally based services. So we aren't over referring for um, services. In fact, a lot of times we end up not disagreeing with the team, but we'll make our recommendation. And then we end up having to provide more services because it's, it is a team decision. It's a very different model than anywhere else. I can make my recommendations based on my professional opinion and what the child needs to support their education. But if the team feels that they need more support and, or the parent puts up a fight or it goes to due process, or there's a bunch of different options that can cause the actual service that gets provided to be different than what my recommendations are. Yes. That IEP meeting is always fun to sit in on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned that you have sort of a can-do attitude with your private practice. And I assume you're talking about if someone calls or if a referral, uh, a referral source calls and says, hey, can you cover this? Can you see this child? Can you cover this school? It, it sounds like you're saying, yeah, we can do that. Is that, is that sort of been your attitude and has that helped you grow? Yes and yes. Um, it helped us grow in the beginning because we went to areas. I mean, we cover the entire Bay Area. And I don't know if you know much about it out here, but we cover kind of San Francisco down as far south as Mountain View, which is, I don't know, could be a two-hour radius depending on traffic. Um, and then on the East Bay side, kind of Albany down to Fremont. And so it's a pretty big radius. And when there wasn't that many of us, there was times that we were kind of driving all over the place. So maybe not as efficient as we've grown. We've looked at, okay, we need to get more efficient. So how do we group people together in different areas? That being said, there are still times when we just got a call today to do an evaluation and nobody's really in that area. But I was like, yes, we can make it work until they came back and said what date the IEP was on. And three of our therapists are going to be out of town at a course on that date. And those are the three that could have made it work in the short timeline that we were just given. So we're probably going to have to say no to that one just because they need the assessor to be the PT that presents at the IEP. Now, we did come back to them and say, does it have to be the same person? Can one of us come out and assess, go over the report with the therapist, um, and have somebody else come present? And they said no. And so we also looked at, since it's a triennial, um, was there a possibility that there's going to be two parts to the IEP and could PT present at a different part? You know, we do try to come up with solutions and then... I said, and if none of those work, here's the name of another therapist that you guys might want to contact. So, um, so yes, so it has helped us grow because we've been willing to look at options, even from family standpoint, you know, how do we make it work with their funding source? How do we make it work with their location or their times? Our therapists have a lot of flexibility. They set their own schedules. They have a productivity minimum requirement um, to be considered a full week. So if they go on vacation, they can see patients make them up so that they don't have to use as much vacation time or they can alter patient schedules without having to go through the front office. Um, but like I said, you know, we are looking at how do we 
hone that in a little bit now so that people are being more efficient. So in the beginning, it was all for growth. And now it's, we need to be more efficient. <laughs> well, and I found that the hardest thing to do is to not say no to Correct. somebody who wants to refer a client or, you know, offer you a contract. It's, it's been, it's been a balancing act in my practice to, you know, to, to have, to have the therapist to actually fulfill the contract. But it's been my theory that I've developed over the years that find the kids first, then go find the therapist because you're not going to keep a therapist if they don't have no ki- if they don't have any kids. So that's, I, I agree with your, your method there as far as, yes, I'll do it. And then yes. hopefully just make it work. Yes. And that's kind of where we're at right now. We have a lot of kids and we are very short staffed at the moment. Um, I know you, with you, we're asking about people being territorial. I actually find out here that I have more competition for therapists than I do for patients. I think we're a little bit unique other than the hospitals. There's not very many pediatric practices out here that take insurance or do a little bit of everything and also provide physical and occupational therapy. So we're always happy if it doesn't work out because of times or locations, we know other practices that we'll refer to and just say, you know, you might want to look into look at these people because we we're not able to meet your needs based on, you know, we've looked at every possibility. So in terms of therapists, like I mentioned earlier, the cost of living out here is continuing to increase. Um, I'm competing against CCS, which is California Children's Services, which is a state funded agency that works with kids from zero to, I don't know what the top age is, but with specific diagnoses like cerebral palsy, more of the neurological diagnoses, and they work under Medi-Cal. And so, but they can offer higher salaries. They can offer pension plans, those kinds, or loan forgiveness because they are a government agency or we're competing against the children's hospitals, which they have the big, they have other people feeding um, their bottom line, small private practice. I have the overhead. I have the salaries to pay, you know, well, maybe our salary package is not the highest, our overall benefit, we put a lot more into our benefits. Um, but it's still, it, that's where our challenge is. And right now there's a shortage of occupational therapists out here. Like everybody is looking for a pediatric occupational therapist and we need two to three right now. <laughs> so, you know, it's, that's where it gets hard because we have the kids right now, but we're not finding the therapist and going to, at least on the PTN, when they stopped doing rolling testing, that made it a lot harder to find people. Tell us what rolling testing is. So for the PT, the licensing exam, when they went to, I think, is it four dates now a year? Like when I came out of school, I just had to sign up and I could take the test whenever. It wasn't on specific dates that you had to qualify for ahead of time. That makes sense. That, okay. I'm OT. So I think, oh. uh, I don't know if, I don't know if they have rolling testing for OTs now or not. I've been out so long. I'd have to ask one of the students. I know that there's, I'm not totally sure. They might have test periods because I know we have a couple people that are taking their tests like at the end of September, but they're on different dates. So I'm not exactly sure how that works. Um, How did you decide, all of my therapists are contract therapists. How did you decide to make your therapist W-2 employees? Um, Because, well, I'm in California and there's, I laugh all the time because I, I never wanted to own my own business. My parents were business owners. I saw the non-glamorous side of it. And I laugh now because I'm like, wow, I went into healthcare in California, two of the most highly regulated areas ever. So clearly I need to have my head examined. But I decided early on that I wanted employees. Um, one, because the regulations, like have, there's a lot of criteria that you have to um, meet to be a 1099. And as I'm not always sure that I can guarantee that they're meeting that criteria, you know, they have to work someplace else. They have, there's a couple other ones I've looked into it. Um, And then with the employee, I really liked somebody that was, I don't know that I want to use the word loyal to the company, but was with the company and wanted to grow with us and really put an interest into what we were building and developing. And they took our core values on as their own and, you know, they felt like part of the family there. I would agree with that. Tell us how your, your paperwork has grown and changed over the years. Well, in the beginning it was handwritten on, you know, a photocopy of a treatment note we had created. 
doing the standard soap note um, with no regulation as to if documentation was getting complete or not other than our reports. I will say in the beginning, we, we've we pretty much always been really good with our reports. Our day-to-day -day notes have you know needed a little bit of help. Um, and then we switched to an EMR and that actually really helped with compliance, making sure one, that our notes became more compliant um, to that notes were actually getting done because now I had an easy way of monitoring them. And I mean, those were the, probably the two biggest, plus it kept everything in one location. So that way, if there's a request for documentation, our office person can easily access it. Um, we also cut down on potential for HIPAA violation because our therapists being out in the cars and out and about, now they're not carrying notes with them. Yes. So that has changed a lot. We did also bring in an outside agency to do We've had them come now three different times to kind of do some document chart audits for us, go over um, compliant documentation, really work with us. And then this last time, they also helped us out with some ICD-10 so that we start prepping for that. I got, I got two follow-up questions there. The first one being, have you always used the same EHR, EMR, over yes. the years? Who yes. Who are you using? We use Optimus. Um, Optimus. They... We helped in the beginning develop some of the pediatric content because there was not a lot out there that had pediatric content. And again, I was a little bit of a squeaky wheel. So um, we have not helped with any of their ongoing development. But in the beginning, we were like, we just need you to have something on there, please. <laughs> like, I need something that'll use. I liked how they were set up in terms of compliance so that you were document, you documented directly under the treatment code that you were billing. So you're showing how you're doing that. You were making changes on your measures or your goals each session. Um, I like that. As a business owner, um, there are some things that they could improve upon, and I've been told that they are. Um, I'm now at the point where I need specific reports. Uh, we have the compliance piece down, but unless I find something that can give me everything I need, I don't know that I will change right this second because as an owner, one of the best things somebody could learn how to do is manage change. So how do you implement, get your staff to buy into what you're trying to do and to take it on and, you know, adopt it. And so we have a lot of other areas that we're working on right now and changing an EMR is not top on the priority. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would totally agree with that. I would, I would not want to change mine right now, although I've thought about it, but mm -hmm. not right now. <laughs> yes. Now your compliance um, company that, that you hired to come in, tell us a little bit more about that. How did you find them and who were they? And tell us about some stuff that they found that you, you have, you're currently improving on. Um, so we used Farron and Levine or Levin, I might be saying that wrong. Um, and we found them just through, I'm pretty involved in the private practice section of the American Physical Therapy Association. So found them through that and I got to know them personally. And then I was like, you know, Hey, is this something that you guys could do? I went to the APTA documentation class, which was great. However, it was like two, two and a half days. And there was a lot of Medicare talk, which I get is important. And they kind of drive what other people are doing. But what I wanted was I wanted somebody to come in, talk to my therapist, let us ask the questions, look at our specific documentation and tell us how we could improve on it. And, you know, and give us the stuff that Medicare influences, but we don't have to sit and listen to talk about Medicare. And we could do it in one day versus two and a half days. Um, so that's how we went with them. And, you know, like I said, they were pretty happy with our reports, but we always knew that those were on the better side. We got better at just the biggest thing was justifying what we as a therapist were doing, what the, what skilled need we were, or what skill we were providing to address the needs. So I know I, when I was back in school, I felt like this may not have been what was happening. I felt like it was a lot about what the patient was doing. We were documenting everything the patient did where our focus now has become, what am I as a therapist doing? Like, why should somebody else pay for my skills? Are you majority billing private insurance or EI, or how's that break down? So we have about, um, about 50% is school-based during the regular year. And the summer, these numbers change a little bit, but sure. I would say 40 to 50% is school-based based on revenue. So not, I don't know exactly billable hours, but based on revenue, 40 to 50 is about school 10 to 15 is EI, 10 to 15 is private pay, and then 30 to 40 would be insurance. Okay. And I know if and you add those up, they don't exactly equal 100%, but there's a little right. bit of a range. <laughs> Changes every month, I'm sure. Exactly. 
But I'm sure you spend a majority of your time on the insurance side of the billing. Um, well, we use a billing company because we were doing it ourselves. And I don't want to have to call the insurance companies to chase down payments. I probably still duplicate what my billing company is doing. And I've actually been working with them and trying to come up with some better systems um, because I'm not okay with an insurance company not paying me the full amount. So they're supposed to pay me $90 and they pay me 10. Like as I enter that into my system, I catch it. And then I'm following up with my billing company where they catch if some, they catch if maybe a code wasn't paid or something wasn't done, but they don't always, if it, if something was paid, sometimes it slips through the cracks there. So I'm still looking for the most efficient way to do that. But I just, and my billing company has at times said, why don't you do this? And we just follow up on, you know, other things. And I'm like, I don't want to call the insurance company. Like I'm fine with the way we're doing it right now. I feel like any other system is going to be more work and I'm going to keep looking for a better system. Yeah. You're, um, your billing company, are they just taking a percentage off the top or are you paying them a flat rate? Percentage. I okay. think it's what? 7%, but I could be completely wrong on that. I've not used a billing company over the years. I've I've investigated or researched into them and anywhere from 6 to 8% is about what I was finding out yeah. as far as what they would take. So, Yeah, <clears throat> it's like right in that ballpark. We had been with one company and then we switched to a different company. So we did switch for that. Um, and it's, you know, my, the biggest thing was the previous company I wasn't getting good communication from. And I was very clear with this company that that's what I needed. And so that has been better. A lot of it, they came and looked at what we were doing ahead of time. And I told them my challenges and they said they didn't know that they could fix all of those, but what they could do was have better communication. So that has helped. Is that a local California company or is that a national company? No, it's a local Idaho company. <laughs> 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 Even better. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, I got to know the owners. I started a, I don't know if you want to call it a mastermind or my parents in their campground industry called it a 20 group after the car industry, but where you take non-competing, non-competes across the country and you get together. And so I started that with Peds Therapy Practices and the billing company, They his business partner is a PT who owns... PT and they were looking to get into peds and have now, but so I found them through that. And so I already knew who they were and I can have a back door to be like, excuse me, this isn't happening. Yeah. What's their name again? Pont Neuf River Receivables is the name of the billing company. Okay. So are they, are they seeking out more, uh, more business? I mean, can we send business their way? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I have actually sent another pediatric therapist in California to them. So. Very good. I might check them out myself. Yeah. They're great. And I mean, and they're really willing to work with you or try to come up with a solution if something's not working, which is what I like. Cool. Yeah, that's, that is good. So we went over your, your, uh, your paperwork. Are you having to market at all right now? Or is it, are you at a point where it's just all coming in and you're just trying to keep up? Um, just, I mean, we're trying to keep up. We, I don't, I don't know that I've ever really done much formal marketing. I'm, I try to stay active on social media. It, you know, ebbs and flows. Uh, as I get really busy, sometimes I drop off on it. I had a blog I was doing, which I have not been very good at. Um, but I, I don't know that we men, got many referrals directly from there. I've always looked at social media as kind of a secondary. So if somebody hears about us and then they go look us up online, now there's all this backfill for information they're like, oh, look, they're involved in this or they're doing this or they have this kind of information out there. So I've never seen it as, you know, being able to calculate a direct return on investment. Um, we do do a newsletter to our past and current clients, but I have not done much with visiting doctors or anything like that. A lot of it's word of mouth. That's the best kind. Yes. Yeah. Your newsletter, are you just, are you just developing that yourself and then using a, an email uh, service like MailChimp? We use constant contact. So we've been doing it probably since the beginning. I mean, I think we have like six or seven years worth and we try to do it monthly. There's been a couple of months we've missed. And what we do is each therapist every month. So in one month, a therapist will have to write two articles. And then the next month, it's a different therapist. And then on, the, on another month that a therapist has to do um, three chart audits. So we are continually... Um, auditing our documentation. So we kind of have a rotating system uh, based on that. 
And then I kind of fill in any new updates or anything like that that's happening with the practice. So our articles could cover any range. It's whatever the therapist is interested in writing about. That's cool. I like that idea. That's a good mm-hmm. idea. Are you are you still treating quite a few clients yourself? I'm not. Um, I have off and on. So I was treating full time up until summer of 2012. And then I have had two hip surgeries since that time. So it was a really easy transition off of treating. You know, it's hard when you're the name associated with the business. And what I love now is actually that my name is not the name associated with the business. I could be in the office and there could be parents that come in that have no idea that I'm the owner unless somebody points it out. And I I like that. Um, Every once in a while, I'll still get somebody that was referred to me. Uh, But I have, since 2012, I have done a little bit of treating. We were short-staffed one year because we had a therapist move back to the East Coast because of family things going on. And so I had to pick up a school caseload and we were continuing to interview and it ended up, we didn't find anybody. So I saw school kids that entire year. Uh, We just had somebody go out on maternity leave in the spring and we were bringing somebody new on about two weeks ago. And so I kind of covered some interim during that time also so that we could keep bringing in patients to hand her a fuller caseload when she came back. Unfortunately, we did too good of a job and now we need to hire somebody else. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like sometimes that's a good problem to have. I don't know how you did a whole year of, of therapy and still run your practice. I, I don't see clients right now. And you and I are sound like we were on a similar trajectory as far as shedding clients. Although I didn't, I didn't have to have two hip surgeries to do it. Man, yeah. that sounds pretty rough. I don't recommend that route. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Um, it was hard and it's harder now. Like at the time, we had a really great admin person for five years and that actually made it easier. And she, because of her kids um, getting a little bit older and they moved. So it was a little bit more of a commute. Um, she chose not to. And we've been since that time trying to find the right fit to replace her. We found some great people for short term and then they've gone to PT school or done other things. And we found some people that were not the right fit at all. You know, we've, we've gotten pretty good at hiring for therapists and over the last couple of years, we've really had to hone our skills for hiring for admin. Um, it's a lot harder, especially because we've grown so much. We need somebody at the entry level position, but there's room for growth because I can't hire somebody that's a way above without having somebody to answer the phone. So it's kind of this mishmash position that has made it challenging to hire for. And now when I've been seeing patients, it's much harder because I'm also having to keep an eye on what's happening in the front office or following up on accounts receivable or doing all those things. And it just pulls me out of the office or away from my computer. And I'd rather play with the kids, but you know, the other stuff is what keeps things running. That's right. Well, and I want, I want everybody listening or watching here to listen to Stacy here. She's juggling a lot of balls and spinning a lot of plates. And that's what it takes when you get to a certain level of your private practice, it's constant. And there's, there's a lot of noise that you got to pay attention to and a lot of fires to put out. So you're doing a good job. It sounds like though, Stacy. Thank you. It's helped that we've created some leadership within our therapist. So I have somebody that I have been grooming to kind of be more of a clinical director and she's a supervisor. So she handles more of the therapist stuff, which has helped. So now I just have to kind of make sure she's doing her job, but it was really eye opening for her in the beginning. She said, it's way harder to get other people to do their jobs than it is to just do your own. And I was like, yes. (laughs) So it's been nice for other people to see that experience or our therapist who went out on maternity leave, she wanted to start cutting back her caseload some. And so she came to me and said, can I fill in in the office for a little bit? You know, I'll, I'll take the admin rate. You know, I still want to have my hands in, um, and she did, and she got a whole nother side. You know, now we have one more therapist that knows that in case we just need coverage for a day. Plus, she got to see the other side and know what goes into keeping things running. That might be a that might be a good thing to do, just to have them work in the office for, you know, mm-hmm. two weeks out of the year, and that way they get a behind the curtain look at what you're actually having to do. Yes, I'm training somebody on just entering accounts receivable right now, and she was like, "Oh, why can't they just put the correct information where it's supposed to go?" And I said. She's like, everybody needs to come do one day of data entry for this and understand why they need to do it the way they're supposed to do it. And I was like, I agree. And we've looked at how to do that, kind of some cross training, and we just haven't come up with the right answer yet. But we do think it's important, like having a PT go spend the day with an OT and vice versa. Because even within the departments, 
you know, we've heard, oh, well, it's easier for the PTs to hit their numbers because of X, Y, and Z, or, you know, oh, what are they complaining about? They're only doing this. So I think it's important for everybody to see what everybody else does. Yes, that's good. That's very good. Have, have you tried in your practice um, different sorts of groups or are you just always doing one-on-one -on -one type of treatment? Over the years, we've tried some, you know, some different groups or just a, an activity where a group comes in and not necessarily bill insurance for that, but just to have a group. Have you tried something similar? We have. We've had a hard time ever getting them off the ground. We have a lot of parents that ask about them. And then when we put them up, it doesn't really take. So summers are usually when we'll try to do some groups one, it kind of fills up our therapist times a little bit more. Also, we've had old patients come back for these groups and then end up starting therapy again. So it's helped out in that way, even though the group itself is not a moneymaker. Um, but our most success recently has been, I'm really into like prevention and wellness and educating families. And how do we get people, one, knowing more about PT or accessing PT or I've seen kids that have developmental delay that shouldn't. And I, that sounds hard about our lifestyles and where we are, the way people are very busy. And there's two working parents a lot of times, you know, it's not pointing fingers at anything, but as our society has changed, so has development. And so really educating families on what they can do. And it's not as hard, you know, people get inundated with tummy time, tummy time, tummy time. And parents are like, I don't know what to do about this. And, you know, they're just like, my kid hates it. So we started a group um, every Wednesday and it's an hour and it's free. And we have a PT running it. She's bilingual. She also has a lot of early intervention experience. And we kind of look at gross motor, fine motor, cognition, social, and self-help, I think are kind of each week's topics. And we call it a developmental play group and we set it for pre-walkers. So parents could self-select in or out. And we've had upwards of 18 kids show up. And then right now we're kind of stabilizing around seven or eight. And, you know, it's been great. We've actually been able to, we use the ASQ or the ages and stages questionnaire. And so we've been able to look at some kids that we think maybe might have either a torticollis or maybe some development stuff going on. So we're actually able to refer sooner back to their doctor or to look into other options so that the sooner you get these kids started, the less of a problem it is. But it's just really educating the parents on what they can do with their kids or how to play with their kids. And that has taken off really well. In fact, now we've added on Thursday a paid group because it was getting so big, we decided to limit the size and people could pay. And it's a six week period and they get a report card at the end for their doctor. They get a little t shirt. Um, it's an hour and a half instead of the hour. And it's more one on like, one-on-one -on -one directed about individual questions where the other is more of a group based. And we've kind of made that as pre crawlers, but my goal is to eventually have kind of like a gym membership. I don't know how I'm going to make all this happen, but you know, where parents pay so much per month and there's different things going on that they could just bring their kids into, whether they were early development or older, or they're looking for ideas on what to do with the kids. And it's typically developing kids that just need a place to do these kinds of things. That sounds cool. I like, I like that. I like the sound of that. Now, how did you decide on you wanted your pre walkers as far as you just wanted to catch kids earlier, or just you like working with the babies? Um, we figured that that was probably going to be the place that we could get in the easiest um, because you parents come. I'm not a parent, but parents, from what I understand from my friends especially, come home and they're like, I, I've got this baby. I'm not quite sure what to do with it, and you know, they just have questions and they just kind of want to be reassured a lot of times. And so it's just, it, we wanted to provide a place where parents could come and just be like, is this right? What am I supposed to do here? Am I allowed to do this with them? Um, and so that's how we kind of picked that. And also I figured that was the earliest stage to get into for prevention and wellness. Now, how did you market that? How did you get people to come to that group? Um, well, the first week we were like, well, we don't know if anybody's going to show up because we didn't even say that they had to RSVP. It was like, show up. And I put stuff on Facebook. I put stuff on Twitter. Um, we made some flyers that we had out in our waiting room. We took a set of flyers over to, we have one doctor that refers to us pretty regularly. So we took a set of flyers over there. Um, we tried to send it to some moms groups and 
somebody saw it on Facebook and put it on a parents group in Facebook and it kind of spread from there. So I'm not quite sure what, like how exactly it happened, but now the parents are telling each other about it. You could have had like a hundred people show up. That'd have been fun. Yeah. So at first we had like two and then we had like three and then it jumped. And I think we maxed out at 17 or 18 and now it's kind of come back down to seven or eight. Cause it's, it was a little too overwhelming with that many, but we'd already like, without knowing how it kind of disseminated, we couldn't really go and change that people know how to start RSVPing or anything like that. And we do like it as a drop-in because parents don't always know what's going to happen or what the child's going to be doing in the morning. I like that. I might, I might look into that for my clinic. I've been looking into different groups and I, I like the sound of that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've had a couple pa- we've had one or two kids or siblings translate into short-term patients from it, but that's not necessarily why we're doing it. You know, if that happens, you know, it's a bonus. We're more just looking to provide a service to the community. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, Stacy, I want to I want to wrap this up here in just a minute, but I want um I want to know as far as your private practice. You mentioned early on that you were getting kind of bored with therapy it sounds like. And then uh do you do you have that set, that boredom anymore? No. Um not overall. I will say I, my personality, I like finding challenges. I like solving the problem. I like implementing stuff or coming up with the system. Once the systems come up with, you know, I don't want to do it anymore. (laughs) I want to hand it over because now it's a nice package that I can give to somebody else. So in terms of like me still doing accounts receivable, because I was trying to figure that out. I figured it out. I figured it out three years ago. I don't need to do it. I can teach somebody else to, which finally I'm starting to now. Um, In terms of actually treating No, although we do see kids for a long period of time. So when I was doing that, it was nice to be able to switch it up a little bit. But again, the year I was in the school district, you know, I kind of went in and I was like, a lot of these kids don't need it, but you know, they still need somebody to come in and talk. So we actually now have a few districts that have adopted a motor group where, so they've infused physical therapy in their special day classes for at least the preschool level, because then we can be in there. We're kind of giving the teachers ideas. So I like coming up with those new ideas. So no, I'm not bored overall. There are maybe days that I could use a little more excitement, but no, I'm doing good. <laughs> well, it sounds like you got your plate pretty full and you've got some good ideas as far as some innovation with therapy and with groups and uh, just business in general. So I commend you for that. That 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 keeps boredom away, you know, to keep yes. your mind moving in different directions like that. And I see I, and you've seen it too. I've seen therapists over the years who are working in whatever setting and they just get bored with what they're doing. And so they try something totally different. You've, I've seen many a therapist start a photography business mm-hmm. or, or do whatever. And they're just bored with, with their therapy. But uh, I've not in, in my private practice, when I was treating my clients, it's just like you said, sometimes you treat them for a long time, but in, in a private practice that you own, Mm-hmm. You can you can do whatever you can do all kinds of different stuff. Yes. So th- that keeps the boredom away, also. Yes, so, very good. Yes. Well, if people wanted to contact you, Stacy, how could they reach you? Through email, I'm Stacy S T A C Y at Starfish Therapies plural dot com. Um, I'm on Twitter either at Stacy Menz S T A C Y M as a Mary E and as a Nancy Z or um, at Motor Smart Kids is our company Twitter handle. Um, we have a Facebook page, Starfish Therapies. We have a blog, um, starfishtherapies.wordpress.com. Cool. I don't know. I think that's most of the ways. Good, good. Well, yeah, if, if people want to check uh, Starfish Therapies out and check Stacey Menz's uh, physical therapy and you provide OT and speech, right? We do not provide speech. We have not been able to find a speech therapist um, we do have a speech therapy group starting tomorrow, renting, renting a room from us though. So um, we'll see how, so we'll have speech available at our clinic. Okay. Very good. Very good. Well, thanks so much, Stacy, for joining me and uh, do keep in touch. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been great. All right. I'm glad you joined us today in our conversation with Stacy Menz. As I mentioned before, her therapy practice is Starfish Therapies, and you can check that out at starfishtherapies.com. You can email Stacy at stacymenz at gmail.com, S-T-A-C-Y-M-E-N-Z at gmail.com. 
Hopefully you found some inspiration in this conversation today because I want you to take some action steps after this interview in order to either start your private practice or to make the private practice that you already have better. Setting goals is the key. We're coming to the end of the year and I always like to set new goals for the new year. So be sure that you do that also. Make sure you're setting goals and that way you can meet those goals. If you have any questions, email me at scott at startatherapypractice.com. Be sure to go by the website, startatherapypractice.com, and you can connect with me on all the social media over there. I have a nice social media button. Click on that button. It says social media, and you can see where all to connect with me at on social media. Thanks again for listening. So glad you joined me. And until next time, Godspeed to you and your private practice.